Well, it's the holiday season, and usually at this time of year, I try to do at least one Christmas-themed movie. Last year, I did the holiday-themed slasher movie The Dorm That Dripped Blood, and the year before that, the Canadian horror classic Black Christmas. Now, I could do another Christmas horror movie this year, but let's be honest. Due to certain fan demand, I think I know what you really want to see. Huh. That's weird. Usually whenever I look over at that window, there's some creepy guy in a mask threatening to cut my balls off if I don't review a Godzilla movie. I wonder where he could be. Well, anyway, the point is, instead of doing a Christmas movie, this month it's gonna be nothing but Godzilla videos. Think of it as a Christmas present to all you G-fans out there. And weirdos in masks who want to cut my balls off. Alright, for my 200th episode, I skipped ahead a little bit to Godzilla Final Wars, so let's go back to where I left off before that one. Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah proved to be a success after the disappointing box office of Godzilla vs. Biollante, and since bringing back one of Godzilla's most popular foes proved to be a hit with audiences, why not do the same thing for the next movie? So, in 1992, Toho brought back arguably their second most popular monster, Mothra. In Japan, the title translates to simply Godzilla vs. Mothra, but in North America, it's usually called Godzilla and Mothra The Battle for Earth, probably to avoid confusion with the original 19th 64 movie where the two monsters fought. Just like the previous movie, this would have a lighter, more colorful tone than the first two entries in the Heisei Godzilla series, but without being as silly as the Godzilla films made in the 70s. Another reason for bringing Mothra back is that according to a poll Toho held, Mothra was the most popular monster with women. Oh, what ladies? No love for Quintuple Banbara? I mean, he does kind of look like a giant rabbit vibrator. Anyway, it begins like a Japanese version of Armageddon with a meteor headed towards Earth. How big is it? It's approximately 93.25 meters in diameter and has a mass of about 848,668 tons. You know, just saying it's the size of Texas would have been a lot more impressive. The meteor lands in the ocean where it awakens Godzilla even though we saw him wake up at the very end of the previous movie. Well, maybe he's just mad that the water's too hot now. Like when somebody flushes the toilet when you're taking a shower. The opening credits are over top of a tropical storm that ends up revealing a giant egg, which is very similar to the beginning of the original Mothra vs. Godzilla. Of course you would know that if I had done a video on that one. Probably shouldn't have done these out of order. Oops, never mind, apparently it's an Indiana Jones movie now. Uh, listen pal, usually in these types of movies stealing an ancient artifact just wakes up another giant monster, and we do not have enough in the budget to get King Caesar to make an appearance. Even if there isn't a giant boulder, stealing the artifact does set off some traps, but unlike Indiana Jones, this guy doesn't manage to save his hat. And I got news for you pal, you're not actually in an ancient temple, you just messed up the new attraction at Tokyo Disneyland. This is Takuya, and unfortunately Unfortunately for him, even dressing like Rambo isn't enough to get him out of jail. Guess he'll have to find another way out. I brought someone. She's 30, she's a distinguished archaeologist, and she's single. Okay, that last part seemed a little unnecessary, but hey, if she can get me out of jail, I guess I could take her out to dinner or something. Bad news, Takuya. He was actually talking about your ex-wife. I'm not single. I've been divorced. But I still don't see any alimony. Hey, I was gonna pay it. I mean, why do you think I was stealing that idol? I know a lot of pawn shops that would have paid good money for that. The government wants Takuya to explore the island where the giant egg washed up, along with a representative of a corporation that plans on developing the island. And his ex-wife Masako wants to come along too, because come on, we gotta have some drama. What do you think? Will they have any problems? I think this will be a difficult task for Masako. I mean, having to work with her ex-husband and all. Look, worst case scenario, it leads to some passive-aggressive dialogue and possibly them drunkenly hooking up again. I'm sure it'll be fine. And hey, Akira Takarada. Who would have guessed he'd show up in a Godzilla movie? While Godzilla vs. Biollante had a message about the dangers of genetic engineering and Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah one about the dangers of confusing time travel plots, this movie has an environmental theme. Well, there have been some terrible changes in the climate recently. Men are destroying the very earth they live on. We can't go on like this for very long. 
Mm, I don't know. Maybe if you made a catchy theme song about saving the Earth, that would be enough to convince people to care about the environment. I can understand why they're so concerned about climate change. They need the polar ice caps in order to have something to trap Godzilla in. Oh, and there's also other monsters trapped in there too. People always talk about climate change causing ocean levels to rise, but they never mention giant monsters also coming out of them. Don't get your hopes up about the expedition being any better. Infant Island may sound nice, but they don't tell you how big the infants get there. And did I mention this movie has an environmental theme? Men destroy what nature's been creating for billions of years. One day all of this will happen to Japan. Well, sure, but that'll be because of giant monsters, not climate change. And we already had a Raiders of the Lost Ark homage in this movie, so might as well throw Temple of Doom in there too. Say hello to Kali in hell. You're the same bastard you always were. I'm glad we're not married anymore. You're worse than I thought! Hmm, well that's one way to avoid alimony payments. Just throw your ex-wife to her death. Just kidding, they're fine. They still need to find King Kong. Uh, I mean, the giant egg. First, though, more Indiana Jonesy stuff. What is it? Cave painting. Excuse me, I believe the correct term is cave manga. Thank you very much. Eventually, they find the giant egg. Now they'll be able to put on the greatest Easter egg hunt the world has ever seen. And since Mothra's in this movie, that means her twin fairy guardians aren't far behind. Hi, can you tell us who you are? We are the cosmos, my friends. The two of us keep the world's natural order of things in balance. And by keep the natural order in balance, they mean they make sure Mothra makes an appearance in a Godzilla movie at least once a series. The Cosmos explained that thousands of years ago there was an advanced civilization on Earth and Mothra was the world's guardian. But then, something terrible happened. Scientists created a device to control Earth's climate. This device greatly offended the Earth. As a result, the Earth got a hashtag going on social media and promptly got the ancient civilization cancelled. Okay, actually the Earth created an evil version of Mothra called Batra, which Mothra eventually defeated. You know, between this and Godzilla Final Wars, it seems like Mothra always gets a backstory of a completely different monster movie that we never get to see. Once again, men are endangering the planet in all sorts of ways. My company has destroyed forests. I feel very guilty. We also use child sweatshop labor, but, eh, I don't feel as bad about that. Speaking of which, here's the head of the company that wants to find the egg, and because he has a mustache, I'm just gonna assume that means he's evil. The concept of a mustachioed businessman finding Mothra's egg and exploiting it for profit is another plot device that was used in the first Mothra vs. Godzilla, although at least in this movie, the businessman's mustache is slightly less Hitler-y than in the original. But there is one thing this movie has that the original didn't. Batra. Yeah, remember that caterpillar monster that escaped from the ice at the beginning? Well, Batra's back and he's gonna destroy the Earth unless people start using paper straws. It's not even hurt. Duh, it's a giant monster in a Japanese movie. Even if he is just an evil counterpart to Mothra, Batra's actually pretty cool looking. Oh, well, what do you know? Turns out a giant caterpillar monster can actually be kind of intimidating. Damn, too bad there isn't a giant bird monster around to take care of Batra, but Rodan won't make an appearance until the next movie. Not only did Batra steal Megalon's lightning horn, but he also has hex vision too. Yeah, run all you want, people, but there is no escape from Batra's purple rays of doom. Considering Batra's busy destroying Japan, you might want to hold off on delivering that egg. It's big. Something big's approaching. What? Something big in a Godzilla movie? No way. What could it be? What do you think it is? It's Godzilla. See? Even he knew that was a stupid question. By the way, this movie also features Miki Sagusa, the psychic woman tasked with keeping track of Godzilla who appeared in the previous two movies, and she really should have seen all these monsters coming and given people a heads up. Now that Godzilla's been woken up by the meteor, he's probably hungry for some breakfast. However, the egg hatches before he's able to make a monster omelette. Unlike in the first Mothra vs. Godzilla, only one Mothra larva hatches from the egg this time, but she's still the cutest caterpillar this side of a glowworm toy. And if you were wondering just how in the hell she's gonna stand up to Godzilla... Yeah, that's right, Mothra. Nibble Godzilla to death. Alright, they did give Mothra some acidic webbing, which is pretty effective. Plus, I think at one point Mothra attacks Godzilla by trying to bite his dick off. 
Well, I got news for you. I think somebody already did that to him. What's that? It's a much cooler looking monster. And one that can actually challenge Godzilla to a fight. Now that Batra's busy fighting Godzilla, I guess Mothra doesn't need to be there anymore. Mothra's going home now! Okay, okay, there's more. Although, how funny would it be if that was it for Mothra for the rest of the movie? We get a pretty cool underwater battle between Godzilla and Batra, and considering how much time Godzilla spends in the ocean, I'm kind of surprised the series didn't do this type of thing more often. However, they get interrupted when an underwater volcano erupts. No, don't do that! That's normally what the monsters fall into at the end of the movie, and we're only halfway through! They're gone. Okay, I know it's a little quick for another fake-out ending gag, but that seriously seems like it should have been the end. Now that they no longer have an egg to deliver, our heroes decide to make a stop over in Manila. Or... Minya? Uh, I don't know. Also, I think the Cosmos just finished inventing a new porn category. Well, at least these two can have some quality time together and potentially patch up their marriage. Godzilla and Batra are suddenly both gone for good now. Well, Batra won't be in another movie after this one, but Godzilla's gonna be back many, many times. Because they no longer have the egg, Ando steals the Cosmos, and the company he works for decides to put them on display in order to make money. Which is pretty much what the plot of the first Mothra movie was. I would say that this movie's recycling ideas, but compared to modern day Hollywood, eh, it's not that bad. Masako and Takuya finally make it back to Japan, but Takuya still isn't ready to face his daughter, mainly because he is really behind on child support payments. I'm starting to think it was a mistake to team up with an evil corporation. Maruto was president. He says they'd insist on keeping the cosmos. Uh, can't you just call the police? I know they're tiny, but I'm pretty sure this still counts as kidnapping. Only one thing to do, call Mothra, which means we get that famous Mothra song. Hmm, they really put the Lil in Lil Nas X. Even before Mothra gets there, the Cosmos managed to escape their Barbie Malibu dream prison. Now they just need to lay low in a roach motel until Mothra arrives. Mothra gets attacked by some destroyers, which is also similar to a scene from the 1964 Mothra vs. Godzilla. Although there, they were attacking Godzilla, not Mothra, so that's a little bit different. Maybe Mothra would get here faster if you sang more. <laughs> Alright, look, I haven't done a Turkish movie in a while, so I gotta put fake subtitles somewhere. Oh, right, Miki's in this movie. So far, she's mostly just stood around looking concerned while plot events are explained to her. I can hear it. Their song. It's close. That's not the cosmos, Miki. You were just listening to the radio. Meanwhile, Mothra finally arrives in Japan. Yeah, she may be the guardian of the Earth, but you kidnap her singing fairy bitches and she'll fuck your shit up. We also find out Takuya is the one who has the cosmos. Hopefully he's not gonna try selling him into sex slavery in order to make his child support payments. Speaking of which... How are you, Daddy? Oh god, I'm in the hotel from The Shining! Look, I appreciate that you're bonding with your family, Takuya, but considering Mothra's destroying the city, you should probably give the cosmos back to her. Mothra wants to tell you thank you! And to the families of all the people she killed during a rampage through the city... Uh... Sorry, I guess? Well, looks like everything worked out okay. Fire! No, don't shoot Mothra! All she did was kill hundreds of people and cause millions of dollars in property damage! Well, that does it. If you guys are gonna be dicks about me destroying the city, I'm just gonna cocoon myself until you calm down. Do you think Mothra is dying? Mothra's not dying! This is just the end of its larval stage! It's larval stage? Yeah, after she reaches a certain point, she evolves into a different form. Mothra's like the original Pokemon. Oh, and if you were wondering if evil business guy still wants the Cosmos... Major huh? attack on it. Look! The army. They got the Cosmos in that basket! Well, way to keep a low profile, guys. 
Ando says that if they kidnap the cosmos again, Mothra will destroy the city. But considering they're in a Godzilla movie, that was probably gonna happen anyway. And let's not forget that this movie has an environmental message. Your company will be destroyed. This company helped to destroy the Earth. Now it's getting its revenge! Look, is this because I secretly buried toxic waste underneath that orphanage? Those kids had leukemia before I did that, damn it! Alright, if you're worried people are gonna be mad that you helped destroy the environment, just do what British Petroleum did and offer a heartfelt apology. Oh, and remember how Godzilla and Batra fell into an underwater volcano and haven't been in the movie since then? Well... Godzilla... Yeah, that's right. It'll take more than a volcano to stop me. You fuckers should have learned that two movies ago. Not only is Godzilla back, but I think he's being hunted by the Predator. He swam from the Pacific Ocean all the way up to Mount Fuji. That's impossible. Any molten lava is at least 1,500 degrees, isn't it? Uh, sure. That, that sounds about right. I'm starting to think the English dub of this movie might be a little off. General, Godzilla is back! What's that? Yeah, what did he say? Godzilla is back! Whoa, whoa, fellas! He prefers the term Kaiju American? Godzilla? He's coming. Yeah, thanks, Miki. We already knew that. Once again, your psychic abilities really came through when we needed them. Fortunately, Mothra emerges from her cocoon just in time to fight Godzilla, and she's even cuter and more adorable than ever before. Seriously, this is probably the fluffiest, most non-threatening Mothra design of the entire series. It's like she went into that cocoon and transformed into a plushie of herself. Nice! See? Even the little girl wants one for Christmas. Mothra prepares to fight Godzilla, but wait a second, if Godzilla survived falling into the volcano, what the hell happened to Batra? Yeah, Batra's so dark and evil he doesn't even need a cocoon. He just wills himself into moth form. And listen guys, you can try all you want, but we know the army's not gonna do anything to Godzilla, even if you do have fancy new laser jet helicopter thingies. Nothing short of a Gundam can possibly stand up to Godzilla. One thing's for sure, all these monsters flying around are really gonna put a damper on these people's vacations. Also, you should probably evacuate the area right about now. Oh no! Oh. What could possibly stop all of them? <laughs> you know, that might be my favorite reaction to a Godzilla rampage ever. Oh no! Oh Jesus! You know, for supposedly being the guardian of the Earth and defeating Batra thousands of years ago, Mothra really seems to be running away from his hex vision rays. Turns out being cuddly doesn't count as a superpower. You can't do this to me! I'm too cute, damn it! Eventually, Godzilla makes his way to where Mothra and Batra are. First, he's gonna take care of these two, then he's gonna see what the view is like at the top of that Ferris wheel. Ooh, another butterfly monster. What are you gonna do, pollinate me to death? Oh, oh you're gonna pay for that, you son of a bitch. Oh! Wow, that's kind of embarrassing. A bug just squashed Godzilla. It's okay, though. Godzilla's not gonna let a little building stop him. I also may have underestimated Mothra. Turns out she's got some rays of her own. Okay, girls, could you please not sing? I'm running out of fake subtitles to add here. Batra gets injured by Godzilla, but Mothra goes over to him and, uh, I think they have moth sex. Kinda hard to tell who's fertilizing who here, though. Damn, even Godzilla got tired of the girl singing. Guess he must be more of a loudness fan. It may seem pretty unlikely that Mothra will be able to defeat Godzilla, but she actually has the advantage considering Godzilla's allergic to that damn dust moths are covered in. Mothra's winning! Oh yeah? That's what you think. Not to worry though, Mothra's got some help. Batra saved Mothra, they've become friends. Huh, guess all it took to get Mothra's evil counterpart on her side was to exchange some pollen. And since Batra dropped a building on Godzilla earlier, guess what he does now? That's right, he drops a ferris wheel on him. Next he's gonna take the log ride and shove it up his ass. You know, say what you want about the Japanese, but they sure know how to put on one hell of a 4th of July celebration. Alright Godzilla, this is what you get for destroying the environment by littering it with crumbled buildings. 
This has got to be really embarrassing for Godzilla. This is the second time in a row he's been beaten by adorable moth monsters. Well, at least this time they didn't put him in a bukkake straitjacket. Before they can get rid of him, though, Godzilla mortally wounds Batra. Don't give up, Batra. Yeah, I don't think saying don't give up is going to help Batra with the giant teeth marks in his neck. The two of them managed to carry Godzilla out to sea. But wait a second, how did that go for Ghidra in the last movie? <laughs> Jeez, way to let Batra down right after he saved your ass. Mothra may be cute, but she is one vindictive bitch. Mothra may have defeated Godzilla, but her work isn't quite done yet. There's going to be a huge meteorite in 1999? Well, 1998, and there's actually going to be two of them. But one will make more money and get referenced a lot more than the other one will. Oh, and I think Takuya and Masako are back together now? I don't know, they don't really say. Bringing back Mothra proved to be a smart move for Toho, since Godzilla and Mothra not only went on to become the highest grossing film in the Heisei Godzilla series, but also the highest grossing Japanese film of 1992. The film was such a success that Toho even gave Mothra her own trilogy of films, starting with the rebirth of Mothra in 1996. So did this deserve to become the most successful of all the Heisei Godzilla films? Um, kinda. Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah may have also reused one of Godzilla's most popular foes, but the time travel plotline in New Origin for Godzilla kept it from seeming like a retread. This one, however, recycles several plot points from earlier movies featuring Mothra, with one of the only major new elements being the addition of Batra. And while it's fine to have an environmental message, it's a little vague and unfocused here. Other than a few bulldozers moving dirt, we really don't see much damage being done to the Earth, especially compared to Godzilla vs. Hetero, which practically seemed like pollution porn at times. I'm also not a big fan of the overly cutesy redesign for Mothra, although Batra helps to make up for this. Speaking of Batra, it's kind of a shame this is his only movie appearance, because I actually wouldn't mind seeing him again. Now having said all that, even if this isn't one of the best Heisei Godzilla movies, it's still a pretty entertaining watch. And I don't just mean for Mothra fans. So there's my first Godzilla video for this Christmas. Unless Toho blocked it and I had to re-upload it, in which case, hey, I made a Godzilla video for Halloween. Well, that's all for now. Until next time.